The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 7735 in the name of Alexander Stewart on brain tumour awareness in Scotland. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. For those members who wish to speak in the debate, please press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Alexander Stewart to open the debate. Seven minutes, Mr Stewart, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am delighted and grateful for the opportunity this afternoon to lead uh, this member's business debate on uh, brain tumour awareness. In order to set the stage and briefly explain why I strongly feel that something more must be done to increase the awareness of brain tumours, I thought it appropriate at this point to highlight some of the salient issues. Brain tumours are the largest killer by cancer of children and adults under the age of 40 in the United Kingdom. Brain tumours reduce life expectancy by an average of 20 years, which is the highest of any cancer we currently know of. 971 people in Scotland were diagnosed with a primary brain tumour in 2014, with a total of 475 people in Scotland dying from the disease in 2015. A full 60% of people diagnosed with a high-grade brain tumour will die within one year, and only 19% will survive for five years or more. Brain tumours are one of the four cancers with a 10-year survival rate of less than 15%. Deputy Presiding Officer, about a year ago, I heard of a tragic situation within my own region, and I'd like to explain that to you now. Mark Richardson from Dunfermline, a father of two with an older stepson and husband to Shona, who is kindly with us today in the public gallery, and I pay tribute to her for the harrowing situation she went through, for the tenacity she's had since that tragic situation, uh, and the amount of work she is now doing to support others in a similar situation. Mark was tragically and suddenly struck down by an undiagnosed brain tumour. It was discovered that Mark had a very highly popular manager with Diageo, and he had uh, consulted a lump the size of a golf ball, uh, which had not been diagnosed, and he died at the age of 32 in May 2016. He died suddenly after Shona found him, collapsed in the Dunfermline home. It came to light that Mark had had affected extreme tiredness and Shona had put this down to his demanding job and having to deal with two lively children. Mark also suffered from neck pain and latterly a bleed on his eye prior to death, but nothing was found even after an eye test. Shona and her friends from Mark's Diageo colleagues together decided they would have a dinner in his tribute after his passing. Now, that event uh, raised tens of thousands of pounds, and also Diageo then contributed a match fund to that event. So £62,000 was raised for the Brain Trauma Charity. And to date, uh, in excess of £80,000 has been raised in his memory. And that includes many events that sh the, the family uh, and Shona have put together. Uh, they had a climb up Ben Nevis where 30 of his family and friends took place in September. And indeed, only a month or so ago, Shona organised a charity walk uh, of between 2.5 kilometres or 20 kilometres, depending on the availability and your ex uh, uh, management of exercise, around Loch Leven, accompanied by their sons and 50 of their family members and friends. Deputy Presiding Officer, brain tumours are currently a cancer of unmet need. The investment which is needed in research to improve diagnosis, find more effective and less harmful treatments, and ultimately a cure has been woefully insufficient in the past decades. Cancer research has done a lot of work, and I acknowledge the work they've done, but progress has not been achieved equally across the sectors. It is a fact that brain tumour patients face a five-year survival rate of less than 20%, yet less than 2% of cancer research funding in the UK in 2016 was spent on brain tumours. On the 29th of October uh, in Australia uh, this year, uh, they launched their $100 million fund to beat brain tumours. The decision has been taken in no small part uh, to the Cure for Brain Cancer Foundation, which has worked hard with the Australian government to secure this funding. This is encouraging, and the announcement arrives at the same time as the United Kingdom 
UK brain tumour charity is right in the middle of a five-year planning strategy to invest 20 million across the world in research centres in locations in Germany, Netherlands and indeed Australia. Deputy Presiding Officer, I firmly believe that Scotland can comfortably follow the lead set by Australia and I would suggest that the work uh, in the third sector funders and brain tumour research from across the world and we can combat if we work together to achieve some of these. The Scottish Government should work closely with brain tumour charities and deal with the research. Now we've got lots of research that's been done and many, many people in Scotland have added to that research uh, and I pay tribute to individuals like Dr Paul Brennan from the University of Edinburgh on the pathway to adult diagnosis which is the ultimate goal for the increasing awareness of adult brain tumours in Scotland. Deputy Presiding Officer, the most important fact for all is the patient experience. It has to improve. With everyone having equal access to treatment and care, that should be our goal as we move forward. The Scottish Government must ensure that the brain tumour patient has access to clinical nurse specialists or key workers who carry out assessments on all the patient holistic requirements following diagnosis with symptoms with signposts in place to ensure that the patient will receive access and support locally. Patients with a brain tumour should have the opportunity to discuss palliative care with consultants at the point of diagnosis. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, I would like to pay tribute to all who have lived with or suffered uh, individuals with a brain tumour and acknowledge the devastating effects that it has on lives for themselves and their families. I urge the Scottish Government uh, the brain tumour charities and health professionals to work together to indeed support and protect people through that journey. And that's why we should have some kind of public awareness and campaign to educate, to give us information so that we understand what we're dealing with. And I pledge that I will do all I can in this place to fight the corner for the awareness of this devastating disease. We need action, Deputy Presiding Officer, not words. We need commitment from government. If we can work together, we can achieve together to support patients and their families. I thank you. Thank you, Mr Stewart. Open debate, speeches of four minutes, a call clear. Hockey, to be followed by Edward Mountain. Ms Hockey, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I refer members to my entry in the Register of Interest. I'm a registered mental health nurse who holds an honorary contract with NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. I would like to thank Alexandra Stewart for bringing this important debate to Chamber today. It is welcome that people are now increasingly aware of brain tumours and the devastating effect that they often bring. However, I'm sure that we will all agree that we can certainly go further. Over the past two decades, a number of high-profile public figures have been diagnosed with a condition which in turn has propelled it into the mainstream. In the music world, we witnessed Russell Watson's brave fights over the years with two pituitary tumours. In sport, people followed John Hartson's journey in overcoming both a brain tumour and testicular cancer. Whilst in the world of politics, we sadly lost the late Mo Molum, who suffered from a malignant tumour prior to her death 12 years ago. Improvements in the prevention, detection and treatment of cancers have seen survival rates double over the last 40 years. However, progress has sadly not advanced equally for all forms of the disease. Brain tumours are often perceived to be a rare condition. However, around 10,600 people in the UK are diagnosed each year and it is our ninth most common cancer. In 2014, over 800 people in Scotland alone were diagnosed with a brain tumour. And as Alexander Stewart has already mentioned, although there are less common, they are less common than other types of cancers, brain tumours are the biggest cancer killer of children and of under 40s in the UK. Depending on where the tumour is found and on the rate of its growth, brain tumours cause a range of different symptoms. Common signs include headaches, sickness and vomiting. People can be prone to having seizures. Sufferers can see changes to their senses, particularly with their hearing and sight, and people's behaviour can also change. I hope that this debate will not only raise the awareness for people's understanding the effects and the symptoms of having a brain tumour themselves, but also help in picking up such changes in others. Only one in five people with a brain tumour will survive five years, but even more devastating is that 60% of people will die within one year. As well as the low survival rate, 60% of younger people will be left with a significant disability. 
Unlike many other forms of cancer, for example, the breast, a benign diagnosis of a brain tumour can be equally as devastating as a malignant one. Due to the growth being positioned on the brain, um, even removing a benign lesion can have a huge and persistent impact on the person. One in four people with a tumour will have sensory loss or lose cognitive functioning. One in three's personality and behaviour will change, while one in two's memory will be impacted. Presiding officer, for those who survive brain tumours, many will be sadly heavily affected and may live a poorer quality of life. Bruce Crawford. I'm very grateful for Claire Hockey's own expertise from her own background has been brought to the chamber today. I think it's been very useful to me to understand some of these things. I just wonder whether or not you think it is, it's in, in, in the circumstances you've described that it's welcome, therefore, that, this, that the Scottish Government are bringing forward a neurological action plan that hopefully can begin to address some of the very issues you, you're laying out in your excellent speech today. Claire Hockey. I thank Bruce Crawford for that intervention and I absolutely support um, the Scottish Government's action on this. Um, the Scottish Government, through their Beating Cancer Ambition and Action Strategy and the accompanying £100 million investment over five years, serves as a blueprint for the future of cancer services in Scotland. And it will improve the detection, prevention, diagnosis, treatment, aftercare and ultimately the survival of people affected by cancer. The £100 million strategy will include £50 million for radiotherapy equipment and to support radiotherapy recruitment and training, £9 million over five years to ensure better support for people with cancer and their families, for example through linked workers, and £5 million to support waiting times and performance. In addition to this, the Scottish Government has also invested £41 million in the Detect Cancer Early programme, which is targeted at those living in the most deprived areas of Scotland. The continued focus from the Scottish Government on early diagnosis is absolutely vital and it will make a positive difference. Cancer services have come a long way over the last few decades, but there is much more to be done to reduce mortality rates. Being diagnosed with a brain tumour can be an overwhelming prospect for those affected and their families, so it's vital that we support them from the detection right through to their aftercare. Thank you very much. I call Edward Mountain, followed by Colin Smith. Mr Mountain, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I also too would like to thank Alexander Stewart for the chance to debate this in the Chamber. At the end of every day that I have the privilege to serve in this Parliament, I know that I'll go home having learned new facts and figures. Some remain just as that, facts and figures, but some of what I learn become ideas that I'm driven to support, to see if I can build on them to benefit those I represent. And this subject falls within the latter group. I knew little about brain tumours before I was elected. I had not come into anyone with this contact with anyone with this form of cancer. Little did I know that brain tumours are within the cancer group that are the biggest cause of biggest mortality in children and, and adults under 40. Sadly, the treatment of brain tumours is about 20 years behind the treatment of other cancers. And one thing is clear, that the 130 different types of brain tumours make diagnosis difficult, and sometimes the symptoms are mistaken for other serious conditions, which then delays treatment. Now, the reason why I want to speak in this debate is to highlight these tumours and to ensure that early diagnosis can lead to early treatment. My reason for wanting to do this is simple. Not long after I was elected to Parliament in 2016, I was contacted by the parents of a boy called Robert, who lived in the Highlands, a piper and a biker who'd been diagnosed with a brain tumour. His parents had been doing all they could and needed a little bit of help to get Robert some additional specialist help. I met with them and Robert, over the, and then over the next few months, we worked together taking his treatment forward. Sadly, in 2017, despite the support of doctors, Robert lost his fight. Now, the reason I mention this story is because of the importance of early diagnosis. In the case of Robert, his family were initially concerned when Robert struggled with his piping and took him to his doctor. The doctor moved really quickly and Robert was diagnosed quickly. But this is not the case for all children. Whilst diagnosis times have dropped from nine to six weeks, we need to do more, and we should ensure that this drops further. Now, I know that Claire Hoy has already mentioned the symptoms of brain tumours, but I think I want to mention them again, because that, I think, will shed light on this. 
As far as babies are concerned, we should be looking for persistent vomiting, lack of balance, abnormal eye con movements, lethargy, abnormal head position, and sometimes fits and seizures. And children above uh, the, uh, the above symptoms can also include walking problems, coordination, and double vision. In teens, the symptoms can also include delayed or arrested puberty and an abnormal growth. Now, ever since I met Robert, I've taken a keen interest in two charities. Firstly, the UK-based Brain Tumour Charity, with whom I hope to promote early diagnosis with in the course of the terms of this parliament. And secondly, a charity called HeadSmart. I'd like to encourage all those who get the chance to go onto HeadSmart's website and to do so to look under the stories section. And there are nine stories of children there who have suffered with brain tumours. They all make clear the importance of early and accurate diagnosis, and that is what we should take home from this debate. I say to all parents, if you recognise any of the symptoms that I've mentioned in your child, take them to the doctor. And I say to doctors, if you see any of the symptoms that I've mentioned, don't ignore the possibility of brain tumours. And I say to the Scottish Government, do all you can to increase the knowledge of brain tumours. And I hope as a result of this debate, if we do that, it will be a fitting tribute to Robert. Thank you very much. I call Colin Smith to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Mr Smith, please. Th thank you, President Officer. <clears throat> Can I also add my thanks to Alexander Stewart for tabling his motion uh, and allowing members the opportunity to discuss how best to make progress on the detection and treatment of brain tumours uh, and also to pay tribute to the memory of all those affected by this cancer. Brain tumours may be the, uh, the ninth most common cancer in the UK, but as Cancer Research UK and the Brain Tumour Charity highlight, it is one of four cancers of unmet need due to the poor survival rate and the all too limited improvements we have seen in the past decade. 60% of people diagnosed with high grade brain tumour tumours tragically die within a year and only 19% will survive for five years or more. As Alexander Stewart and Edward Moulton showed in their opening remarks, behind the statistics are real lives real people and real families tragically affected. And the number of people affected is on the rise with brain tumour incidents increasing by 16% from 2005 to 2015 in Scotland. Over the same period, the number of deaths as a result of brain tumours increased by 14%. Whilst mortality is increasing at a slower rate than incidents, progress still remains far too slow. Ensuring that brain tumours are detected and treat treated as quickly as possible is, of course, crucial to improving progress both in the detection and treatment of tumours. But we know that the identification can be incredibly difficult, both for those with tumours and for medical professionals. The symptoms of brain tumours are, are wide-ranging and non-specific, and they can vary depending on where in the brain the tumour occurs. In fact, 31% of those with brain and central nervous system tumours visit a healthcare professional more than five times before being diagnosed. And 37% of diagnoses occur after an emergency admission compared to an average of 9% across all cancer patients. However, as the motion highlights, there has been some progress since 2011. The average diagnosis time for childhood brain tumours in the UK has decreased from 9.1 weeks to 6.5. Here we can see the positive impact targeted efforts to improve early detection and raise awareness can have, and it's vital that work continues to improve recognition and understanding of symptoms in order to further reduce diagnostic time for children and adults alike. We also need to ensure that primary care services in our communities are accessible and adequately resourced. As a common first point of contact in our healthcare system, primary care has a vital role to play in providing early detection, but difficult to access in these services adds an additional barrier to treatment. This is particularly true in relation to people with general and seemingly non-urgent symptoms as are common amongst those with brain tumours. As well as improving diagnosis for brain tumours, there remains a need to improve our knowledge and treatment capabilities through research. As all speakers have highlighted so far, across the UK, brain tumours are the biggest cancer killer of children and adults under the age of 40. Yet in 2016, less than 2% of cancer research funding was spent researching brain tumours. Pioneering work on the subject is taking place across the world and technological innovations are constantly creating opportunities to transform how we diagnose and treat brain tumours. In several Scottish universities, that important work is being done. Dr Nick Leslie at Heriot Watt is exploring the, the potential uses of 3D printing in brain tumour models. Dr Brennan at the University of Edinburgh is working to establish 
why some adults take longer than others to be diagnosed and to understand how brain tumours progress. And at the Edinburgh Sick Cancer Research Centre, a number of teams are working to better understand brain tumours and develop potential new treatments. We must do all that we can to ensure that this vital work has the support and, of course, the funding it needs in the future. It's also important to recognise the role social care may play in delivering care for those who have or, or will have brain tumours. The Scottish Cancer Patient Experience Survey found that the proportion of people with brain tumours offered a care package was the second lowest of any cancer type at just one in five. In palliative care, the, the picture is equally lacking. Research by the Brain Tumour Charity found that the majority of people with a terminal brain tumour diagnosis were not given a choice of end-of-life care options and almost half felt they had not been given appropriate information about end-of-life. So, President Officer, in concluding, it is clear that whether it is improving detection, treatment or care, there is much still to be done to tackle this cancer, which many argue has not had a high enough priority. Thank you. Thank you very much. Call Liam MacArthur to be followed by Emma Harper. Mr MacArthur, please. Thank you very much indeed, Deputy President. Officer, can I to congratulate uh, Alexander Stewart on securing this important debate and welcome the opportunity to make a brief contribution to it. Can I also offer apologies to you, Deputy President Officer, and others that uh, due to the fact that the uh, Justice Subcommittee is taking place right at this moment, myself and uh, Callum Steele have some catching up to do uh, after the, yesterday's debate on policing, so I will have to leave uh, slightly early, but I will certainly read with interest the contributions uh, made during the remainder of the debate. And this is, as others have already said, an important issue. I pay tribute too to the work of Cancer Research UK and not just highlighting brain uh, cancer, but also, I think, supporting research into the, the, the causes and, and indeed how it can be treated more effectively. As others have said, over the last 40 years, we've seen very welcome improvements in prevention and detection and treatment um, that have revolutionised uh, cancer medicine uh, and, and survival uh, rates. But uh, that hasn't been consistent uh, across the piece. And brain cancer is one of four cancers of unmet need uh, that have been identified uh, quite rightly by Cancer Research UK. These cancers have a poor five-year uh, survival rate, as others have mentioned, uh, which has seen limited, very limited uh, improvement over the last uh, decade. And I think cancer research are quite right uh, to prioritise the improvement, both of the quality and the quantity uh, of research into uh, these four uh, cancers. That's certainly uh, the view of those involved with uh, the Friends of New Reward uh, ARI in Aberdeen, a group who deserve our gratitude and support, uh, as do the other campaigners mentioned by uh, colleagues in their remarks. I pay personal uh, tribute to Carolyn Critchlow and Carolyn Toshney uh, in particular, uh, but they are certainly very well supported by other volunteers in this group. And they've done incredible work uh, over the years, raising money for the new reward, new reward in Aberdeen, but also raising pro the profile of the issue that we are debating uh, today. Carolyn Critchlow is in absolutely no doubt that the main issue is uh, that diagnosis is still coming far too late. Uh, there are lots of different brain tumours and their symptoms, um, as Claire Hockey outlined, uh, are easily uh, confused with other things, as the tragic example referred to by Alexander Stewart uh, illustrated. Uh, there seems to be a reluctance, for whatever reason, uh, to refer for MRI scans, and as a result, too often people are presenting at A&E, uh, by which stage it is invariably far too late. This in turn puts pressure on neuro wards that tend to be underfunded and that's because of a, a wide ranging nature of the referrals uh, for head injuries, for spinal tumours, uh, MS, MND, Parkinson's, etc. And they don't benefit or don't appear to be, benefit, uh, be benefiting from the funding that supports all of these diseases. I'm told that the new uh, Glasgow Hospital didn't include a neuro ward uh, in the new build and I'd certainly be interested uh, to know the reasons uh, for that decision. The underlying problem... Uh, yeah. Claire Hockey. Just for, for a point of clarification, there is actually a neuro department on the site of that hospital. Lee McCarthy. That is, that is helpful and encouraging to, to know. The underlying problem, though, is that not enough is known about uh, brain tumours. Only 1% of cancer research funding is being spent in this area, an amount that in real terms has gone down. Uh, uh, rather than up. And this is tragic and, and also rather inexplicable when, as we know and as others have mentioned, it's the biggest cancer killer of children and adults under the age of 40. So more research, earlier diagnosis and greater awareness. And I thank Alexander Stewart for at least helping with the, the latter of those three and hope that we can see much more progress on the first, uh, first two. But meantime, a 
Apologies again, Deputy Presiding Officer, to Alexander Stewart, the Minister, and others that I will shortly have to leave the Chamber to attend the committee. Thank you. Yeah, it's fine if you want to leave just now. The subcommittee is sitting. Uh, can I just say before I call the, the, the next speaker that in order to call all the other members that wish to speak in this debate, I'm minded to accept a motion under Rule 8.14.3 that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. And I'd invite Alexander Stewart to move that motion. I'd move that. The question is that under Rule 8.14.3, debate is extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we agreed? Thank you. I now call Emma Harper to be followed by Ian Gray. Thank you, President Officer. I would first like to congratulate Alexander Stewart and bring this important date to the Chamber today. And I need to remind Chamber that I am a registered nurse. Um, the operating theatre was one of the areas of uh, clinical practice that I gained experience in. And today's debate is about raising awareness of brain tumour and the effects that the signs and symptoms, diagnosis and treatment have on not only the patients but the families of those affected. And while researching for this, I was reminded of the terms glioma, glioblastoma, astrocytoma, stage one, stage two, stereotactic biopsy, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, all different words used in the language of caring for people with brain tumours. And I acknowledge that the motion wording says that there's over 130 types of brain cancer. In 2003, while working at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, I was able to participate in tumor removal surgery that was performed called awake craniotomy. Sometimes a tumor is in an area of the cerebrum where the speech center is located and preserving speech following surgery is an obvious optimal goal. And this can be achieved using this specialist technique. And so I was reminded of this work that I have participated in on reading the motion and doing the research for today. In 2014, 971 people in Scotland were diagnosed with a brain tumour and in 2015 around 475 people died as a result of a tumour in their brain. I also pay tribute to the people, the families, the lives affected by brain cancer. One of the most important factors in the successful treatment of a brain tumour is early diagnosis and I'm going to focus my time on that. Last year, I was contacted by HeadSmart campaign so that I could help raise awareness of the HeadSmart programme, which has already been mentioned by my colleague Edward Mountain. I was asked to raise awareness using my social media contacts. HeadSmart is an internet-based site to help by providing education about symptoms of brain tumour, especially that can lead to an earlier diagnosis, especially in children. I mentioned children as according to the Brain Tumour Charity. 10 to 15% of childhood brain tumours in the UK are high-grade astrocytoma. It's called a diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, or DIPG. This is a fast-growing tumour originating in the brainstem, and it often appears in children aged only six years old. Children and teenagers, young folks, the symptoms might go undiagnosed until more problematic, as adults may think of some of the symptoms as part of growing up. One description was that a young teacher forgot the pupils' names and her text messages became garbled. And later she was diagnosed with a brain tumour, so these garbled text messages and not remember the names were actually associated symptoms. And when individual symptoms are connected, action can be taken. The site describes symptoms as persistent or recurrent vomiting, persistent or recurrent headache, abnormal eye movement, movements, blurred vision or double vision. The abnormal eye movement, for example, could be the appearance of a new squint, bulging eye or other um, eye problems. Problems with hearing and loss of balance and coordination. So some of the children described wobbly legs and fits or seizures are also part of the symptoms. The, heart, the Head Smart Decision Support Tool for healthcare professionals on the internet sites gives guidance on when to reassure, review or refer and will lead to neurological examination, CT or MRI scan and as part of the clinical pathway for diagnosis and treatment. Presiding officer, there is so much involved in the care, treatment and family support around brain tumour disease, but the recognition and diagnosis at the earliest opportunity is one of the most important aspects of getting the right support and care. The impact of the head smart campaign is that childhood diagnosis time is reduced from 14.4 weeks to 6.5 weeks so this is a great achievement 
I will conclude again by welcoming this debate and reiterating the importance of raising awareness of cancer of the brain and again thank Alexander Stewart for securing this debate today. Thank you. I call Ian Gray to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Mr Gray, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and thanks to Mr Stewart for bringing this important motion uh, to the Chamber. As we've heard, uh, brain tumours unfortunately impact families and communities the length and breadth of Scotland. Indeed, today's debate was highlighted to me by a constituent uh, who got in touch to share his story of how he tragically lost his son last year to a brain tumour. Two more uh, of my young constituents, Luke Stewart from Trinent and Alex Logan from Preston Pans, uh, have recently been diagnosed with an extremely rare form of malignant tumour uh, known as DIPG, which is extremely difficult to treat. This form of tumour affects only 20 to 30 children a year in the UK, but we have two cases diagnosed within a few miles of each other. The local communities uh, have rallied round uh, Luke and Alex. Luke was told by the NHS that they could only provide radiotherapy to give him some semblance uh, of a quality of life, but he is now receiving treatments in Mexico uh, after hundreds of thousands of pounds were raised to fund a new treatment he is only the seventh patient in the world to receive. The family report that the benefits have been significant, but how hard they have had to fight in order to get them. Alex's family are, are now fundraising too, and once again, their friends and neighbours are stepping up to the plate, not least uh, Press and Pan's boxing superstar, Josh Taylor, who dedicated his recent defence of his silver superweight title to Alex and his campaign in front of a television audience of millions. And while it is welcome that Luke now has access to the treatment he needs, and while I know uh, that Preston Pans will not let Alex Logan down, we have to put our hands up and say that we are letting them and their families down. They should not have to depend on fundraising to get the treatment they need and which can help. They should not have to travel to Mexico to find the treatment they need. As we've uh, already heard, uh, over the past 10 years, survival rates from brain tumours, tumours in Scotland have shown little improvement. Brain tumours kill more people than leukaemia in Scotland. Deaths have increased by over 15% in the past 15 years. Brain tumours kill more children and adults under the age of 40 than any other cancer. And yet, we've also heard uh, that cancer research spending in the UK features less than 2% dedicated to uh, research on brain tumours. That simply cannot be right. It is time we did better for youngsters like Luke and Alex. Thank you very much. Um, I call Ruth McGuire to be followed by Claire Baker. Ms McGuire, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you to Alexander Stewart for bringing this important topic to the Chamber today. This debate is fundamentally about raising awareness of the signs and the symptoms of brain tumours. And the importance of doing this can't be overstated. It really is a matter of life and death. I'm sure that I wasn't alone in being shocked by some of the statistics and stories I read about in preparation for this debate such as that nearly one third of people visit a healthcare professional more than five times before being diagnosed, and that 37% of patients with brain tumours in Scotland went straight to hospital for diagnosis, compared to 9% of all cancer patients in 2016. This is because of a lack of understanding amongst both the general public and healthcare professionals, which can mean that brain tumours can often go unidentified and undiagnosed for a long time. When they are finally diagnosed, if it's too late to treat them effectively, the result can be the patient deteriorating quickly and dying. This can and must be improved, and by raising awareness, it can be. This has been proven beyond doubt by the UK-wide campaign Head Smart, which has radically improved average diagnosis times for children and young people. Based on the Diagnosis of Brain Tumours in Children guidance produced in 2007, HeadSmart is a public-facing campaign which focuses on raising awareness of the signs and symptoms of brain tumours in children and young people. Through educating both the public and healthcare professionals, the campaign has succeeded in saving countless lives and in markedly reducing long-term disabilities. 
Before 2007, average diagnosis times for children with brain tumours in the UK was 13 weeks. Four years after the publication of the guidance for healthcare professionals, this was reduced. And most recently, average diagnosis times have been reduced to 6.5 weeks. The goal is now to get the average diagnosis time down to four weeks. The campaign so far has demonstrated how much of a difference can be made simply by raising awareness. And if we continue to do so, I'm confident that we can achieve this goal for children and young people, as well as for adults. As well as raising awareness of what we currently know, another crucial strand in better dealing with brain tumours is new re research. I was pleased to read about the pioneering research projects currently underway in Scotland at the universities of Edinburgh and Heriot Watt. And I hope that the Scottish Government will capitalise on those research findings in due course, in addition to the action it's already taking such as the first Scottish Cancer Patient Experience Survey that's published in partnership with Macmillan Cancer Support last year. The findings of that survey highlighted good practice as well as areas for improvement. Responding to this in September of this year, the Health Secretary announced the formation of a Ministerial Cancer Performance Delivery Group to drive forward improvements in waiting times for diagnosis and treatment for cancer patients in Scotland, supported by £1 million of new funding. An additional £3 million was also announced to increase the number of radiology trainees in Scotland by at least 50 over the next five years. This investment, plus continued national awareness raising, will continue to focus our minds on further improving outcomes for brain tumour patients, whose diagnosis and treatment still lags behind that of other cancer patients, and which can and must be improved. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Claire Baker, last speaker in the open debate. Ms Baker, please. Um, thank you, President Officer, and thanks also to Alexander Stewart for bringing this debate um, this afternoon. Uh, I would like to welcome some of my constituents to the Chamber for this debate. I have been contacted by a number of constituents who are living with a brain tumour diagnosis, and their stories have been very effective in highlighting the challenges that people face when fighting this condition and trying to get on with living their lives. Um, I would also like to thank the Brain Tumour Charity and Cancer Research Scotland for their briefings in advance of the debate. Um, Alexander Stewart has highlighted the key issues around the experience of people, the health and emotional impact on them, the difficulties with diagnosis and the lack of awareness of the condition. There are two things that struck me in particular from the briefings. Um, first, the stress there must be for the individual in trying to achieve a diagnosis. We know that um, a third of diagnoses come from emergency admissions into hospital and also um, 31% of people are diagnosed, have to, sorry, 31% have to visit their GP at least five times before a diagnosis can be um, decided on. Now, I recognise the difficulty there is in trying to diagnose. I think that's been highlighted by other members. The condition can also look similar to other conditions. It is relatively uncommon for a GP to come across this condition. So I do understand uh, the difficulties there are in diagnosis, but that must be extremely frustrating for the person who's waiting for that diagnosis and their families. Um, brain others have said, you know, brain tumours are a cancer of unmet need. Um, there is needed to be more investment to, um, the investment has been inadequate to address some of the key issues around improving diagnosis, finding more effective and less harmful treatments, and also ultimately finding a cure. And I think the briefings and other members have highlighted the importance of research here, that it can make a meaningful a difference to people and I've highlighted the work of Dr Paul Brennan and also um, I'd highlight the work of Dr Dirk Seiger who is looking at particular work around enabling the faster development of drugs to actually try and uh, treat the brain tumours. There are um, examples of where the treatment um, is difficult for people to experience and we could see improvements around patient care. Secondly, the thing that struck me is um, the patient experience through all this. Uh, there are models of care from other cancers that we could replicate here. Um, we do have clinical nurse specialists in other areas and we know the benefits they are, that they can provide, they are vital to supporting people. And often we recognise that the clinical care and the consultant, um, the, the experience that people have there is excellent, but, and it's so important, but when they finish that engagement, they can often feel it, uh, abandoned, they are dealing with the shock, they're dealing with um, the stress of having received that diagnosis, 
they often come up with many questions that they can't remember the answer to. They've had a short meeting with their consultant, so they have many unanswered questions often. And they are also having to face significant changes to how they live their life. And at that point, a clinical specialist, a, a nurse clinical specialist, can provide some really valuable support and signposting to support um, people. It is the most prevalent life-shortening cancer for children and adults under the age of 40, which must make diagnosis um, extremely concerning. I would highlight some of the uh, emails I've had from constituents. Michelle emailed me. She got diagnosed with a brain tumour just over a year ago when she was only 25 and says that her whole life has changed due to the symptoms that come with this horrible disease. And she had to give up her job and she had to give up her college course due to being so ill. And at the age, I mean, she's only 26, at this age she feels that she has no life anymore due to this diagnosis. And it's physically and mentally took over my life. It is a, you know, it's a cancer I feel that because it affects this age group, we're maybe not um, as experienced in how to deal with supporting those patients. And I think it is an area that really needs um, some focus. Um, I was also contacted, it impacts significantly on people's life, their home life. We're often seeing parents who have young children uh, being affected. And I was also contacted by um, Elizabeth, who her and her husband uh, both work. They claim no state benefits, but they, were, they, had a young, they have a young daughter and they were trying to access early nursery care and feeling that the situation they are facing should have made it easier for them to qualify. Um, they were unable to pay for childcare, which was the situation, given they're both in work and they're not claiming benefits, that seemed to be the answer they were given about how to deal with this. Um, I think that situation has now been resolved, but it illustrates how uh, families who are uh, often, you know, trying to look after young children, trying to deal with this diagnosis, the kind of challenges they face. Um, and finally, sorry, President Officer, I'd just also like to mention um, that it is an extremely stressful time for people, and the stats show that people don't often have the support that they need and they often don't have enough understanding for their employers or the agencies, which suggests a lack of understanding here and the impact of the condition. That's all been reflected in the emails that I've received. And I'll just finish with um, Ewan, who also contacted me, who said that another key interest for him was the nature and provision of support post-operation. And the impact upon families and their patients is enormous. And the challenges last a lifetime, particularly the mental health and well-being aspect that we must also give attention to. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call on Aileen Campbell to close with the Government Minister, seven minutes or thereabouts, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I, like others, would like to thank Alexander Stewart, Stewart for securing uh, this debate. And I appreciate all the contributions made from all members this afternoon. And uh, to, to pick out and the professional and authoritative contributions from both Claire Hawkey and Emma Harper. Uh, the Scottish Government recognises the dam damaging impact of all cancers, including brain cancer, on individuals, their families and friends. Brain cancer has a devastating impact on younger people, being the biggest cause of cancer deaths in those aged 40 or under. And I want to pay tribute to, like uh, many have, uh, uh, in Mark Richardson, who was mentioned in Alexander Stewart's uh, motion, and also welcome Shona to the Chamber and recognise that tremendous effort to raise an enormous amount of money in memory of Mark. And again, just to reiterate how sincerely sorry we are for the sad passing of Mark. Um, Edward Mountain similarly spoke about Robert, and it sounds like he was an incredibly wonderful and talented lad. And again, it was important that Edward uh, Mountain did take that time in his remarks to raise again the awareness of all the signs, especially those signs that may be missed by uh, parents. Uh, similarly, again, Ian Gray, and I appreciate him for raising the stories of both Luke and Alan and uh, Alex. Sorry, and while I know that we all wish him well, I also want to extend an offer to meet with Ian Gray about their cases to find out about more if there is anything more that could have been done, if that would uh, help. And again, we probably all want to uh, put on record our hopes that both of uh, both Alec and uh, Luke can have uh, the recovery that we all hope for them. Uh, Claire Hockey also mentioned the fact that this is not just uh, constituents that have been impacted by um, brain tumours, but many uh, notable people like John Hartson, Mo Molum uh, as well. And for me, I also want to pay tribute to a teacher at a school in my constituency, Moira Struthers, who recently, untimely and sadly passed away. She was a remarkable woman who, uh, for by being an incredibly popular teacher, was also heavily involved in the community. She volunteered, she raised money, and she also did all that she could to help anyone who was in need. 
and I've had many constituents contact me about this debate, all echoing the calls that we've heard about today regarding the need to raise awareness and research and also making sure that Moira's experience can inform the way that we move forward. So clearly what unites all those stories that we've heard today is, is a need to do more and to make sure that we redouble our efforts uh, around uh, brain cancer and brain tumours. Before that, though, I do want to outline some of the more national approaches that we're taking towards our cancer strategy. And in uh, March 2016, the Scottish Government unveiled its Beating Cancer Ambition and Action Strategy, which serves as a blueprint for future of cancer services in Scotland. The Government is aware that early detection of all cancers, including brain cancer, is crucial. And the strategy will deliver £100 million of investment to improve the prevention, the detection, diagnosis, treatment and aftercare for all those affected by cancer. So there is good work, but as we all acknowledge, the improvement felt in some areas of cancer uh, are not replicated in others, showing that there is still much more that we need to do. Our £41 million Detect Cancer Early programme has increased diagnostic capacity across Scotland, as well as increasing awareness of the signs and symptoms of cancer. Next year's programme, however, will focus on the detect early detection for all cancers, and that aims to encourage anyone with any concern or changes to their body to visit their GP. And with regard to raising awareness of brain cancer, my officials met with the Brain Tumour Charity in Headsmart earlier in 2017 to share crucial information on signs and symptoms of brain tumours via our We See social media channel. And I've again instructed my officials to meet with colleagues from brain cancer charities to discuss how we can further support awareness messages and also to consider research opportunities. Building on that request that was made by, I think, Alexander Stewart for charities, the third sector and government to work together and work collaboratively. To improve cancer diagnosis, the Scottish Government has also supported the Scottish Referral Guidelines for Suspected Cancer, which were revised and published in 2014. And those include a specific section on brain cancer and are intended to help clinicians identify those people most likely to have cancer and require urgent specialist assessment. These guidelines, though, are due to be reviewed and refreshed next year. And again, this will be assisted through that engagement with those third sector and, uh, charities and organisations that have a particular and specific knowledge of brain tumours. So again, that will enhance our ability to raise awareness and make sure clinicians are able to identify people most at risk and not be um, caught up in the fact that those symptoms can often mimic other conditions. We all know that, though, however, that where a diagnosis of brain cancer is made, the huge variance in sight and tumour type can make cha treatment challenging. And Clay Hockey was also right to point out the impact of even a benign tumour it can have. Now, I welcome the research funding in Edinburgh and Glasgow from the Brain Tumour Charity and also the increased focus from CRUK on less survivable cancers such as brain cancer. And these centres are carrying out internationally leading research into many different areas around diagnostic improvements, developmental biology, neuroregeneration and neural stem cell biology. Researchers though, can also apply to the Scottish Government Chief Scientist Office for funding and applications aimed at improving the diagnosis and treatment of brain cancer would be uh, indeed very welcome. Ruth Maguire and Claire Baker, though, talked about the importance of the patient experience. And the first Scottish Cancer Patient Experience Survey was published in June 2017 and covered all aspects of the cancer care journey, from thinking about that something might be wrong through to the support received after acute care and treatment. And whilst national results revealed that 94% of people had a positive experience of their cancer care overall, areas for improvement were highlighted. Particular concerns for people with brain tumours included the high number of emergency admissions, provision of care plans, access to information and access to clinical trials. These findings will assist in identifying where to target future improvements and I would want to see these improvements reflected in the next cancer patient experience survey. Also taking on board the uh, suggestions raised uh, today, for instance, Claire Baker outlining that real need to have a broader uh, package of support uh, of, uh, alongside the initial clinical interventions that may have taken place. Members also raised the issue of appropriate palliative and end-of-life care services and the Brain Tumour Charity have highlighted the need to ensure people with brain tumours have the option of discussing palliative care with clinicians from the point of diagnosis and I'm pleased that Scotland already has a very good reputation for palliative and end-of-life care. 
This year, the University of Bath Institute for Policy Research published a policy note that Scotland is taking bold steps to improve palliative and end-of-life care services and support. And we want to ensure that everyone has access to palliative and end-of-life care tailored to their individual needs. Our framework for action on palliative and end-of-life care contains a number of commitments to improve services and to support to help meet the needs of people and their families. To achieve our aims, we must create the right conditions nationally to support local communities in their planning and delivery of those services. And this ethos is at the heart of our health and social care integration agenda, and it is reassuring to see the positive outcomes of that beginning to be reflected. However, uh, to close, uh, Presiding Officer, I want again to uh, offer my thanks to the members for their uh, contributions to today's debate. We know that we must keep looking to improve how we deliver care and, how, and consider how we can equip ourselves to deliver even better health and social care services in the future. The cancer strategy will assist with this, but it will also require us to work together collaboratively with contributions from people living with cancer, carers, the voluntary groups, professionals and professional organisations and, of course, uh, our dedicated NHS staff. And in memory of Mark, of Moira, of Robert, Michelle and all those impacted by brain tumours, we must ensure that their experience informs our actions going forward and that we can make improvements on the uh, uh, life expectancy, the, uh, the impact, the, the broader impact on their families. We must make uh, improvements in those areas uh, and we must see the uh, increased research and opportunities that that brings to make the improvements that I think we all seek and want to do so in the memory of all those that have been mentioned today uh, in the debate. So again, uh, Presiding Officer, I thank uh, Alexandra Stewart for taking the time to raise this uh, important debate and for all the contributions and uh, just acknowledge that we want to endeavour to do more to make the improvements that are so necessary. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate, and I suspend this meeting till 2.30.